We're here at Foster Creek along North Mills River Road in Mills River, North Carolina. We're the Mills River Partnership and I'm Maria Wise, the Executive Director. We work with farmers and residents of this community to improve the water quality in the Mills River and its tributaries. And Foster Creek is a major tributary of the Mills and we've identified it as a big contributor of sediment and sediment is really our largest pollutant in our waters in North Carolina. So some of the projects we do include things like fencing cattle out of streams and putting in wide grassy field borders to catch sediment before it runs into the stream. This project is going to be much larger and all-encompassing and a stream restoration project that's more sustainable in the long run. One of the reasons you get so much sediment in these streams is because over the years they've been straightened or channelized due to road building or farming activities. So this project will add some of the original natural meanders or curves back to the stream. It will also slope the banks and provide more plants on the stream banks to hold the stream banks in place with the roots, the riparian buffer. So we're here today in the initial phases of this project. We want to make sure that it's an effective project, so we'll be checking the health of the project along the way. One of those ways to check will be macroinvertebrate sampling. In other words, we're going to be looking for as many bugs, water bugs, in the water today before the project begins. And then we'll do the same sampling throughout the life of the project and afterward to ensure that we've actually made a, a positive impact on this waterway. I'm Greg Jennings and I'm an engineer who works on stream restoration and ecosystem improvements uh, throughout North Carolina and surrounding states. And one of the opportunities we have today is to talk to the landowners here at Living Web Farm about some potential stream restoration projects on the property. It's a great stream here, Foster Creek. It drains into Mills River and opportunities are really outstanding to do some ecosystem improvements. So Pat, uh, tell us what your goals are on the farm here. Sure, Greg. Um, we've got this farm basically to do some more demonstrating of sustainable and regenerative farming techniques. We already have a smaller farm, but this farm is where we're going to try to show that we can accomplish similarly restorative farming systems on a bigger scale. And we are very inspired to have the creek and the river on both sides. We understand the importance of water systems and we look forward to integrating all of the ecology into our farm process. We're not just about farming in, in open flat land, but we're also about farming with diversity, about creating value everywhere, about taking advantage of the different ecologies to create a more diverse environment so that our row crops are more sustainably balanced as far as the life that comes in and the solutions to insect problems. We also are, have all along thought that we would use the wild areas slowly as resources that we could show that you could actually maintain them and still get value from them from the production of native plants that you might might propagate there for ornamentals for medicinals um, and then we look forward we've always planned on planting things like pawpaws um, and elderberries and other riparian plants on the edges for production good well that that's great to hear and part of our Overall program, anytime we approach a restoration project like this is understanding very clearly what the landowner objectives are. And so understanding that sustainability, regenerative systems, ecosystem health are all values that the farmer has, the landowner has, helps us come up with a plan. So our restoration plan not only addresses what lives in the stream and the stream water quality, but also how that complements the overall land management program. The idea of a streamside buffer plant community that can be used as part of the farming and food operation is exciting because it allows us to create 
the plant community that provides shade and leaf matter to support the aquatic health, but also provide some food product for the landowners. Yeah, I, I, I'm excited about that. Um, I know that some of the farmers that are part of our crew are worried that we will be sacrificing too much of our productive land to accomplish that. So it's gonna be interesting to see how that dynamic works. And probably the most challenging piece that I see is we are pretty committed to using the fertility of animals in our farm you know we, we understand that natural fertility systems include right. plants and animals always right. so that's the part that is going to be most interesting to see right. you know is there a way that some of the edges actually have forage quality plants on them right. where the you know we can either do chop and feed or let the animals graze a little bit towards the edge right. um, it'll be interesting to see how we go with that and, and that's excellent too to understand how this farming operation is very holistic. It does include both plants and animals, livestock, grazing animals, and also wildlife all coexisting. And so we'll be looking at the stream conditions, the aquatic health. Uh, we have some biologists here today, David Penrose and Jason York, who are experts in quantifying stream health based on aquatic insects that live in the streams. And what they're doing today is collecting those insects before we do any stream restoration, before we do the improvements to the overall health of the stream corridor, and telling us, well, how, how healthy is the stream based on those insects? And then over time, we'll be able to monitor those, repeat these measurements, and as we adjust the stream conditions and even some of the land management conditions, we can continue to monitor these indicators. They're essentially the canary in the coal mine type indicators. If the right insects are living in the stream, that tells us that we're doing a good job managing the land and the watershed. If we see indicators of problems like nutrients, uh, which is in fact something we've already observed today, is that quite a bit of algae is found in this stream indicating some potential nutrients. Nutrients come from fertilizer that runs directly into the stream and possibly cattle that might be upstream that are entering into the stream. Well, if we see those indicators of problems, we may want to adjust our land management and really strive for that overall integrity of the ecosystem. Right, yeah, we, we want that too. We actually, the longer we follow our regenerative practices, this land has been only in cover crops since we bought it, right. um, and we've used no fertilizer. We applied biochar to that field, but that was the only thing, and that actually should help hold the nutrients. And basically, the longer we grow, the more we find we don't need the nutrients. We rely on cover crops for our fertility, right. and then you know, mob grazing with animals. We haven't had any animals here yet, yeah. but we do it in a way that we, the nutrients get bound up quickly, and there's rapid regrowth, right. so that shouldn't be an issue. And indeed, all along, my vision for this land is that the edges would be in permanent crops. We won't be working the soil. They'll basically be grasslands that the animals can work. Or right. There's a new farming technique where you actually can graze the grasslands down and then no-till drill into them and grow crops right in the pasture. And so the reason for that is both to make sure we're sequestering any, any um, free nitrogen and phosphorus or other potentially polluting fertilizers and also to be sure that should we have a major water event, flood event, we have something holding the soil so we don't lose our soil. And that's a great point, Pat, because one of the things that we've observed about this stream is there is some erosion happening right on the stream banks. So there's potential for sediment that is eroding from those stream banks to come into this stream and really cover up the spaces where the insects live. Uh, not only is that sediment harmful to the local community of insects, but some of that sediment runs on downstream. It enters the Mills River. Uh, the Mills River also has impairments due to excess sediment. So all the work that we're doing here in the land management and the stream bank erosion protection will affect the overall stream and the Mills River all the way down to the city of Hendersonville's water intake. Right, that actually is like the, the bottom line when I talk to our board about doing this. It's like, why really should we do it? It's because it's the right thing to do. Because you know we all live downstream, but we're also upstream from somebody else. And we wanna be responsible members of the community and ensure that you know, 
the, the resource that is everybody's is being maintained at its max on our property anyways. Based on talking to Maria and these guys, I'm very optimistic we'll be able to show a big improvement uh -huh. in the stream. And of course, all the land activities mm -hmm. will change this overall mm -hmm. ecosystem too. But the bank erosion, part of that, of course, those alluvial sediments that are in the banks are heavily enriched from yeah. previous agriculture. Exactly. Yeah. And keeping that soil in place will reduce the loading. Good morning. My name is Dave Penrose. I'm a I'm a stream ecologist. So basically what I do is study the life in stream systems. And this particular project is really exciting because I think it's got a lot of potential to show improvement in the stream. We have a, a team of people here that are collecting aquatic insects from the stream sample. And basically what we're finding are a couple of things. First of all, the stream Despite the fact that we're here in the best time of the year to collect aquatic insects, it's April, and we should be seeing all kinds of really intolerant or clean water taxa, what we're seeing are fairly tolerant taxa, or those organisms that are suggestive of water stress. There are issues in this watershed. And one of the major issues is enrichment. We're seeing signs even this time of year that there's algae starting to proliferate in the stream. Uh, I suspect that as the year goes on, the water temperatures warm up and the flow is restricted a little bit more, that algae will proliferate even more so that it's a real problem. This project can correct that. I think with proper land use management, uh, watershed restoration uh, and stream design tools I think this would be a very, a very good project to talk about how a stream can improve. So I, I wanted to show you a couple of insects that we collected. This insect right here is really abundant in the stream. It's a, it's a filter feeding caddis fly in the family Hydrocycidae, which doesn't mean a whole lot to a lot of people. Um, but basically what this caddis fly does is build uh, nets filtering nets. It filters the water for fine particulate material. So if there's a lot of material like that coming in the stream, if there's you know, cattle waste getting into the stream, or if there are septic tanks that aren't working properly, or if there are you know, other sources of enrichment, this type of organism becomes extremely abundant in the stream. And it, like I say, it filters the water for its food. These are other types of caddis flies. They're called grazers. So oftentimes in a stream that's polluted with enrichment, uh, the, the algae builds up on top of the rocks. These organisms also proliferate because they're feeding on the algae that's growing on the rocks. So the stream currently is not uh, extremely diverse. There's a lot of tolerant insects uh, living in the stream. Here's another interesting insect. It's, a dip, it's in the order Diptera. The common name is a crane fly, and it's a shredder. Types of organisms like this are in leaf packs, and they're busy shredding the, the leaves uh, to make it uh, you know, smaller and more digestible for other organisms. But that's a, that's a Tapula, a hydrocycid caddis fly, and these are grazing caddis flies. That one there is pupating. And there's also these organisms, which I just noticed, the ligachetes in the stream, which probably isn't a good sign as well. So the hope is that, you know, once we work on the watershed management techniques and tools, that we can clean up the water that's coming into this particular feature uh, within a relatively short period of time. I think we can show that the stream will improve within a year or two. Certainly by five years, water quality and the Diversity of insects in the stream will improve tremendously. That's the hope. This stream changes tr dramatically from uh, this reach here. You're looking at a, a reach of stream that's actually, it looks pretty healthy. I mean, it's got a lot of big boulders and some bedrock and typical, I guess, for some of the streams and the mountains around here. But as soon as you leave this reach, and either go upstream or downstream, 
it flattens out considerably and there's lots of sediment in the stream. I think the sediment is being transported relatively effectively through this reach. But if you go upstream or downstream, that does not happen. So I think part of the restoration project will also be to uh, improve sediment transport and to improve the flow of sediment through this stream. So the combination of uh, watershed management to control enrichment and nutrients and stream management to control sediment accumulation should improve um, the water quality and the biological health of this stream tremendously. Okay, so today we are here looking for hellbender salamanders. They are giant aquatic uh, salamanders that are about two feet long. The the adults can get that big. And it's important here because this, while there have been salamanders found in this river before, we haven't actually surveyed the site here. And there's an upcoming restoration project that is going to be taking place. So it's really important that we survey here to get a good base of the animals here so that after the restoration takes place, we have something to compare that to. Did they go up? Did they go down? That sort of thing. So right now we're looking under large rocks. Anything that we think would provide really good cover uh, that's not very s silted underneath, uh, that's a problem for a lot of hellbender areas. The large rocks that they would make their nests under typically get filled in with silt and so we're looking for those areas where there is a crevice underneath the rock and we dive down and kind of use our dive lights to peer back in there. Is there even a crevice there at all? If there is, is it occupied by a hellbender or not? We typically work from downstream to upstream, kind of if fanning out, choosing a lane, if you will, in the river so that we can cover the entire area. We typically try to work at least 100 meters. I think we did more than that here, um, probably about twice that. And it really depends on the habitat, if there's good habitat or not, we could work more. Uh, if it just doesn't look good, we might do less or pull out and walk upstream away. If there were some places that didn't look too good. Um, there were some places that looked all right. Uh, I think that, well, I'm really excited to see what it looks like after the stream restoration takes place.